Hi, this is Starkey Sowers. Welcome again to another Plus Program training series. Today's topic is macronutrients, proteins, and this is part two. So we've kind of been going through this series on macronutrients. We went through carbohydrates, and now we're going through proteins, and later on we're gonna go through fats. So a couple unique things about macronutrients. Number one, when we look at macronutrients, obviously they provide calories for the body, they provide energy. All right, so the other thing is they have structural components as well as some other components around the body. There's also what we call micronutrients, which are vitamins and minerals, and we've had a lot of discussions about that as well too. But a couple of unique things about macronutrients, obviously uh, the body requires them in large amounts. It's one of the reasons why they call them macro, and their sizes obviously are large as well too. Macronutrients, as we said, provide all sorts of different types of functions for the body, which makes them very critical for us on a regular basis. All right. So looking at proteins, one of the things we want to remember about proteins is this. When we think about proteins, the word proteins comes from the Greek word proteos, which means of primary importance, meaning that protein is probably the most important macronutrient, no question about it. A couple unique things about proteins, obviously proteins and fats, we cannot live without. Carbohydrates, we can live without. Ultimately, it's a little uncomfortable living without carbohydrates, considering they're a primary energy source for the body, but we ultimately could if we had to. All right, so with that said, proteins not only have primary importance, but they also have some great structural as well as other functions in the body. So when we look at proteins, where do they fit in? So we've talked about structural components such as muscle, tendons, ligaments, and also skin and things of that nature. The other thing we look at is enzymes. They're necessary for function of digestion as well as for cellular function, enzyme functions in the cells. The other thing is hormones as well as energy. The body can actually take amino acids after they've digested the proteins and make glucose out of it. Another thing about them is they're necessary for the immune system as far as like making immunoglobins and things of that nature. Another thing is hormone systems. Another final thing is pH balance. It actually helps to balance the pH in the body. So we see amino acids or proteins all over the place and the body needs them on a daily, regular basis. Obviously the word proteos comes true in this particular situation. So a lot of you guys might be thinking, well, how much protein do I need a day? So a couple unique things, the government has kind of established what they call a minimum requirement for proteins. So when it comes to females, roughly about 50 grams a day. When it comes to males, roughly about 60 grams a day. So not a huge difference, but there's some caveats in there. When we start looking at proteins later on, we're gonna look at some conditions conditions of proteins and things kind of change a little bit. So that would be kind of an interesting moment. One thing to remember about proteins is this, they're not all equal. So when I say that, it's kind of a unique saying. Protein sources of foods become a little bit different. So for instance, when we look at animal sources of protein, such as milk and milk byproducts, as well as chicken, as well as lean meats, and I say lean because ultimately it's better than the, the heavy laden marble fatted uh, fat, so to speak, that you'll find in heavier meats, but lean meats as well as like turkey, chicken, eggs, all these other different things are great sources of protein and they're animal sources. As we were talking about in the last uh, training series, we were talking about eight essential amino acids. In order for the body to have those eight essential amino acids, proteins are the way to get that. One thing we know about animal source proteins is those eight essential amino acids are always in abundance exactly in the proportions that the body needs. It's kind of a unique situation. So you might be thinking, well, what about vegetable proteins? Vegetable proteins are a little bit different. As we look on the chart that we see, vegetable proteins, and there's all different types of vegetable proteins. You look at the category of legumes. Soy, for instance, you've also got in there like uh, beans and, and as well as also the nuts and seeds category, as well as the grains. And there's proteins in everything, but just in various amounts. The dominant sources for vegetarian sources are gonna be the legumes and and the grains giving you the dominant sources. Well, a couple of unique things that happens with that. They lack oftentimes some of the essential amino acids. As you remember those eight essential amino acids we said was TV till PM, which was threonine, valine, uh, tryptophan, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, as well as phenylalanine and methionine. Those amino acids will vary in different types of grains, nuts, and seeds. So ultimately what happens is you can produce what we call a complementary protein system by using a combination or a variety of different types of vegetarian proteins. Of the primary proteins, when it comes to vegetarian, the most complete are going to be soy and soy derivatives, as well as amaranth, quinoa, as well as rice and some of their uh, combinations together. But ultimately, when it comes to complementing proteins, a couple different things to remember is maybe eating grains and legumes together. Those two together produce what we call a complete or a full protein that the body would want to use or be able to use on a regular basis. 
All right, so that kind of gives you a little bit of background on it. One thing that I want to do too, to kind of finalize this series, to look at some specific things when it comes to protein needs. So when we look at protein needs, we know one thing for sure. The body needs those 50 or 60 grams a day, depending on whether you're female or male. But at the same time, there are certain instances where it actually changes. So those particular grams, 50 and 60 grams, were established for individuals that were relatively sedentary. So as soon as you activate, everything changes. So if you're working out with weights, specifically if you're working out more than like 30 minutes on the average throughout the weekend, it's more aggressive and much more, uh, more aggressive than sedentary walking or something of that nature, the protein requirement goes up. And so ultimately it ends up being roughly about 1.6 grams per pound of body weight, so, or sorry, per kilo. So ultimately that ends up being roughly about a gram per pound of body weight. And that varies a little bit, maybe a little bit less, a little bit more depending on the type of activity that you're doing. But once you start exercising, the requirement it goes up. All right. So with that said, another situation is aging sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle tissue actually occurs for anybody over 60. We know that anybody over 60 actually needs roughly about 70 to 80 grams of protein a day to prevent this. All right. So you might be thinking, okay, well, what else? Pregnancy, the last two, the second and third trimester, as well as lactation increases the requirement for protein as well to roughly about 70 grams a day. All right, so it kind of gives you a wrap up, gives you a little some incidences on it uh, and your requirements for proteins. Hopefully this has been helpful for you. This is Starkey Sowers. Thanks again for watching another Plus program training series.